able for the reading of God's word. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? More than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Sinless offerings, for your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. For your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. Become a burden to me, and I am weary of When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. So wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right and seek justice. Defend the oppressed. And take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. You may be seated. Well, a couple months ago, we had a Thanksgiving offering, and we wanted to come back and just talk about that with you and uh, some exciting things that we're going to be doing uh, as elders and pastors. We met, we've been praying and researching and talking about how can we use those funds that were given by our people for his kingdom. And it's really in three different areas. The first one is to take money and to give some to the, uh, what we're doing in Dominican and specifically in something we haven't done before to find and to support a pastor who is lo- uh, not a pastor, a doctor who is local there Uh, to keep up with the records and to keep up with the people that we see. So many times people, groups come in, groups come out. We go to this village, that village, and there's lots of villages in the sugarcane fields. And you're not quite sure who you're visiting and when and who helped them last and all that. We're going to try to bring more organization medically to that, which will be a great help. And uh, so we're looking forward to giving some money and investing in that um, process. Secondly, more and more, there's more and more people who are walking to our building. I don't know if you've even come in here this morning, how many people are walking up the driveway and on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and on Mondays, there's lots of people who walk to our building. And to make that a safer experience for them, we're going to build a walking path parallel to the driveway that goes from the sidewalk at the street to the base of the parking lot up here uh, so people can get here without worrying about cars coming in and out and all of that. So that's going to be the second phase. And thirdly, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we were talking about this idea of better communicating with our community and to improve the signage out front. A lot of times the sign faces a certain way and it's dark, it's unclear. And I don't know how many people I've talked to, but they say, there's a church back there. That's interesting. I, didn't, I never knew that. So we're going to improve that communication for our community. Let them know we are here and that there is a wonderful gospel to be heard as well. And so thank you for what you have given. And uh, we're excited as a church uh, to use those funds for that. And as uh, we were sitting around as elders and pastors, we said these are things that will be around for decades to come. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing how God will use them uh, for his kingdom. So thank you uh, for that. Well, there's one phrase that is uh, very, that's spoken of more than anything else when it comes to playing sports. If you're a coach, I'm sure you've used this with your team before. But the phrase is this, there's no I in team, right? Whether it's basketball, football, soccer, whatever the sport might be, we have used this phrase as a coach. I know I have. And the idea speaks to not focusing in on one person, but having the focus on the bigger experience of the team. And, uh, but it's interesting. In our American culture, in the last couple of decades especially, there's been more and more people trying to find the I in sports in team. And even if you look at this, there's actually an I as well, right? You probably have already seen it as in the A. You're like, there's an I right there. But probably the most famous example is when the Chicago Bulls coach, Phil Jackson, after practice one day, pulled his team aside 
and he had them in the locker room, and he used this phrase on them, there is no I in team. But quickly, one of his team members, his name was Michael Jordan, quickly said this, but there is in win, to which Michael Jordan was saying, it is going to be about me, and I will take that responsibility on. I will be the person you can count on. I will be the person who will take the shots in hard times. It can be about me. And probably since that point forward, sports, team sports, has never been the same since, where we have always been as a culture enamored with the eyes on teams. For instance, uh, you probably, uh, if you're a, a fan of fantasy football, you know that it is all about the eye, right? You could care less if the Packers win, but Aaron Rodgers better throw four or five touchdowns, right? Or you don't care about stat sheets uh, of, of teams, but you, we are enamored with people who do well individually, setting records with home runs or setting some other kind of records as individuals. And so we like that as a culture. We love to see individuals do well. And there's also another word that doesn't start with or have the letter I in it either. But many times we also try to force this letter into it as well. And that is the word church. Finding the I in church. And like our affinities with sports and sports figures, when it comes to church, we can become the people who really make church all about the I. All about me, what I want. Listening to the people who I want to listen to. Listening to the voices that I like to hear. Oh, he sounds so good. Or maybe it's about ideas that we resonate from a certain person. Or maybe it's about certain ministries. I have my favorite ministry, and that is the ministry I am loyal to. My allegiance is to them. Or maybe it's even music, right? I only like it when I hear this kind of music. We can become those kinds of people who are trying to force the I in church. And forcing the eye means that we're making the focus all about what we want. And is it really what church is all about? What we want? This is what we're going to be exploring this morning, finding the eye in church, and should we? And is there a better way? And so this is our second week in this series, um, a brand new series to the book of 1 Corinthians, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Holiness. And the idea from last week we saw from the beginning is that God, the God we worship, is into change. And especially when it comes to his people and the lives that we live. And life is very, very messy, as this uh, picture depicts. Life is complicated on lots of levels, whether it's our family and all of the issues that we deal with and with our kids or, or at work, all the things that, we go, that go on and all the things in our lives outside of those things. And it can be very messy on lots of different levels, but yet what we see is that God wants us to be people that are becoming more like his son, changing. And change is hard, and it isn't always easy, but that is what he is calling us to, holiness. And so that's what we're going to be exploring as a major theme uh, for the next number of weeks in the book of 1 Corinthians. And even this week in the letter of 1 Corinthians, the challenge is going to be to us as individuals and what we want and what we desire is it all about us. Because many times, if it is about what we want, there are things that can be very damaging to the body of Christ if we make it just about the I in church. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, starting in verse 9. I encourage you to bring your Bible with you so you can read it for yourself. If not, we'll have it on the screens around as well. Um, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in 1 Corinthians. And um, also, if you notice uh, out the kiosk, maybe you missed these, but we have some bookmarks that are also going to go along with the series. This will take us all the way up until April. Um, you can read along with the passage that we're going to be uh, reading for next week, and you can read along, and, and uh, it'll be a great thing. Even if you're not into regular scripture reading, this would be a great time to start and uh, maybe get reacquainted with God's Word that way. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. All right, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the church of Corinth, reminds them that God is faithful. And this faithful God has very high expectations for his people. And one of our favorite Greek words of fellowship is what? What's that Greek word? Koinonia. Yeah, here it is again. See, we studied it in Acts and we saw it in other books. Here it is in 1 Corinthians as well. His desire is for his people to be in fellowship. This idea of koinonia. And so after some nice words of, of introduction, the first nine verses, kind of a nice opening, a prayer for them, his desire for them, he now moves into his really his strong statement in verse 10. I appeal to you, he says, and it's an obvious statement that's, that's much stronger than hey, here's a nice idea or hopefully this goes well with you. He says, no, 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 here is something I beseech you. This is something you have to do. I appeal to to you. This is something that isn't happening. Listen to me. Listen to me, church in Corinth. And what he does, he wants to grab their attention. And notice, it's not just grabbing the attention just to make a statement, but these are people he cares about. These are his, as he says, his brothers. And the term is used to talk about brothers and sisters in Christ. The church there, he cares deeply about them. So listen to me. And much like a parent who has hard things to say uh, for a child. The other night I was, I was at a basketball practice and I was on the sidelines just listening and one of the coaches asked one of the kids to do something and he wasn't doing it. And, uh, and, and the parent from the sideline was saying, Bobby, you need to do that. And I was thinking, wow, that's interesting. You know, parents are chiming in there. But I was thinking, you know, I probably would have said the same thing too if that was my kid. And it just speaks to the love and care that we have for our own kids is the kind of love and care that Paul has for his own kids, his spiritual kids here in Corinth. And he's willing to say the hard things. He's willing to say the things they need to hear. And so this is what he says. I want you to be, notice what he says, I want you to agree. I want there to be no divisions, that you be united. You, see, you get the theme here, right? And the idea of united is, is, is a Greek word that means to have a, a broken arm or some kind of fracture and for it to be mended. There is something that is broken in the church, and I care so deeply for you to listen to me. I need you to listen. Okay, and as a reader, we probably think, all right, what's been broken? What's going on here? Verse 11, let's, let's continue the story. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Uh-oh, there's been an informant, right? Word has gotten back to Paul through Chloe's people. There is quarreling and internal quarreling. They're fighting with one another. And this is a really serious problem. Why do I say that? Well, if you did a word study of quarreling in the New Testament, you would notice that Paul links this word in a whole list of other things that are happening many, many times. I mean, when he talks about drunkenness or envy or sexual immorality, idolatry, sorcery, jealousy, the list goes on and on. But many times in these lists, you'll also find the word quarreling. And what Paul is saying is that when there is quarreling going on in the church, when there are divisions other things can happen. Other things can work their way in that are not good. And so this is why Paul is so passionate. There are divisions. Stop them. So what were they quarreling about? Let's continue in verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. Or I follow Christ. And what we will discover is that these people in the church had their favorites. They had their favorites. It's like this section right here. Their favorite would have been Paul, right? Paul was uh, the founder of the church, the traditionalist. He was the one that was there from the beginning. Many of the earliest converts were because of his work. And so because of them, their affinity was to Paul. He's our man. And their mantra became, I follow Paul. I love it when he teaches he can do no wrong. We will follow him. Well, then there was another section in the church. 
their mantra was different. Their mantra was, I follow Apollos. Apollos, he's our man, right? Who was Apollos? Well, we know that from the book of Acts, he was one who spoke very eloquently and when he spoke boldly. And whenever he was around, people loved to hear him talk. He spoke with this powerful tone. He was even so bold that he would, he would argue with others in, in public contexts. He was willing to mix it up and verbally jab them. And he was entertaining to listen to. He could make anything sound good. And so there was a section of the church that said, I follow Apollos. He can do no wrong. He's, he's our man. But then there was another section of people. They said, and their mantra was this, I follow Cephas. And Cephas is the Aramaic name of, of Peter. Peter is our man. And Peter had visited Corinth at some time. He was there. We know that. And so he was one who represented this converting from a Jewish background. And we know from other scriptures that Peter had this fiery side to him. And he was even willing to oppose Paul at different times. And so the people there were like, we follow Cephas. He is awesome. Whatever he says, we do. We follow him. And then there was another section, and their mantra was, I follow Christ. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, it, that's a good thing, right? But see, what Paul is setting up is this, all of these groups that have set themselves up and to be elite. And most likely what was going on is this group that says, I follow Christ, was using some biblical teachings to kind of wield those over others. And, and they were thinking they were better than all the rest. And so the interesting thing was that all of these different mantras, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ, all of these things weren't coming from the peoples whose names were on them. Paul and Apollos, they got along really well. They helped one another. There was no comp competition between them. And we know that between Peter and Paul, there was one time they were against each other, but they, they weren't at odds with one another. They worked together. And so these different mantras and allegiances were coming from the church, from the different groups of people. This is our man. We love him. We will follow him. And that we know is that at the heart of all of these different factions, the church was being splintered and divided. And there was quarreling that was going on. And at the heart of all of these mantras is one tiny word, I. It was about the I. And they were the people who were forcing the I into the church. And for them, it had become all about what they wanted to hear, what they liked, what sounded good to them, what they agreed with, what they were comfortable with. And they took it to the next step of their allegiance to this man was then causing them to be exclusive. And they would wield this against other groups. You listen to Apollos? Oh, come on. He's such a young guy. Why would you do that? You listen to Cephas? I had this problem with him. You listen to Paul? How stuffy is he? And so they were becoming elite and arrogant in their statements and their allegiances towards following different men. And what this communicated was that their focus was really on their own self and what they wanted. And they couldn't have any other people speak to them but just their man. Our family was recently at a, a, a gathering where there was a, a buffet of chili Lots of chilies, chicken chili, spicy chili, regular chili, lots of chili. And so our family was going through, and uh, my youngest son, he, he asked me as we're going through the line, which one did mom make? Well, the problem was mom didn't make any of these chilies. And uh, I said, well, there's one that's just like mom makes. You know, just, did mom make that one? No, mom did not make that one. <laughs> And so off of the buffet line of chili, he walks away with a plate full of Cheetos and cheese. <laughs> he wouldn't have any of it. He didn't want it. Mom didn't make it. He didn't want it. And that's exactly what was happening here in Corinth. 
It's exactly what was happening. They only were listened to the one who tickled their ears, the one who, who taught them best, the one who they connected with the best. And added to that was this elitist attitude that the man that they best listened to was the only one they could ever hear from. It was the only kind of chili they would eat. They wouldn't have any of it from any other people. And so in the culture of Corinth in the first century, this kind of personality-driven leadership was very, very popular, where people associated themselves with, with different high-profile people. It, it, was, it was something that everybody was doing. Chrysostom, who was a Greek orator, he was someone who was a philosopher and a historian, whose name actually means the one who is golden-mouthed. You got to know that guy's got to be good, right? He would come into town and, and he would give such great speeches and people would gather. He, this is what he would say in his experience in Corinth. He would say this, I was escorted with much enthusiasm and respect, the recipients of my visits being grateful for my presence and, and begging me to address them and advise them and flocking around my door from early dawn all without my having incurred any expense or having made any contribution. Huge crowds would, would flock to personalities and people who would come to town. And so in the culture, we see that they are hungry to follow individuals who would give them what they'd want. And so this kind of idea was now bleeding over into church as well. Well, it's good enough to follow Chrysostom. Let's find our own church leaders and let's follow them. Yes, this is what we should do. And so the culture was pointing that way and the church as well was going in and finding their own favorites. Everybody else is doing it, right? And so as we take this passage and we fast forward 2,000 years, the questions and the application to us is strikingly similar, is it not? As you hear about this context, there is an amazing correlation to our own context as well. And the question is this, are we the kinds of people who make church all about the I? Is the focus on what we want at the end of the day and what meets our own selfish needs. You see, just like Corinth, we have already admitted that our culture outside of these walls is much like the, cor the, the culture in Corinth where the individual is, is heralded and it's a wonderful thing to follow. American church culture loves its idols it loves its leaders, right? Whether it's in the area of, of entertainment or sports or politics, we align ourselves with this person and we will follow them, right? But also that idea works its way into the church as well. And we have our own favorites and we have our own people we follow and the things that we will listen to. Our favorite teacher, I can only listen to this person. He's the only one that can really speak to my heart, right? Or we have our favorite ministry. Like my, this is the ministry I am loyal to, and this is the only thing I will ever align myself with. Or maybe it's music. I can only listen to this kind of music. If, and it has to be a tuba, because if it's not, then... <laughs> Speaking of music, I was in college, and... A, a college student, I was going to a church and I was the person who would time it such as so that I would not show up for the music and the worship at the beginning because I didn't like it. This is really embarrassing. But, and so I did not show up. I would kind of work my way in and I'd hear a nice sermon and work my way out. And I think back and I think, oh, how selfish is that? It was all about me and what I wanted. I was making church just about me. It's so easy to do, to make it all about what we want. And the focus becomes about 
the things that we need or we think that we need. And it becomes this idea that our, our individual and then goes to the next level of being elite. It has that ability to say, well, I only listen to this guy and he's the only one that can speak to me and I, I won't listen to anybody else. And so our individualism leads to this elitism that can then very easily lead to being divided. Being divided. Radical individualism that feeds exclusivity that leads to divisions. It's not that hard to see. It's very easy to happen in the church. Well, Paul will continue. In light of all of this, he has some more questions. He needs to bring more clarity and focus to the church in Corinth. This is what he says in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. And what Paul does is he wants to help bring focus and clarity. Do you realize what's going on in the church? Do you realize what you're doing when you make these statements about Paul and Apollos and Cephas? And he starts off with three rhetorical questions. The first one is this, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? No, but you're making him such. And the word is much like you would take a, a pie and you would slice it and you would give a piece here and a piece over here and a piece here and take the piece that you want, right? Is Christ divided? What is happening is that he was being divided in the church in Corinth and there can be none of that. Take, taking up your favorite slice is not what Christ is about. Is Christ divided? No, he's not. And then he moves to the next question. Was Paul crucified for you? And the questions are becoming more and more obvious, right? Of course not. Were you baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and your favorite pastor? Is that what it was all about, right? And he's making it look ludicrous and absurd. Of course it's not. But for the church in Corinth, who had deep passions and love for certain people, Paul is calling them out and he's telling them that when you act like this and when you have these kinds of mantras that you support, you sound foolish and you're selfish and you're really being childish. You carry this out to its logical conclusion and you will see that being sold out to men in programs and following them at the expense of ever listening to anybody else will lead to you being dividing up the church, divisions in the church, splinters and fractures to the body of Christ. It was the early 1500s when a man named Martin Luther, he lived, the reformer. You will know that probably his famous moment was tacking on to the door, the 95 Thesis, right? And this was statements about what is true salvation about. Salvation is by the grace of God alone and is not to be earned by anything else. And so he made that statement along with other statements about the authority of Scripture being exclusive for finding truth and knowledge of God. It can't be found in any other places. And many, many other statements he tacked up. And so shortly after that, his followers and people who would subscribe to his, his teachings and his theology was flourishing. And so the question became, what shall we call ourselves? Let's call ourselves Lutherans, right? Lutherans. Listen to what Luther thought of this idea. He was still alive. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor, stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? 
I told last hour we should get t-shirts with that. That'd be great. Bumper stickers about maggots, poor stinking bag of maggots. But he's spot on, isn't he? This is so true. And it's so easy to do to, to exploit people and to say, yeah, they, and put them on these pedestals. And Luther would have none of it. He would go on to say, may God protect us against the preachers who please all the people and enjoy a good testimony from everybody. Faithful preachers should teach only the word of God, seek only his honor, should seek only his praise. Back to Paul. He'll bring his thought and his, to a conclusion in verse 17. After all of the, thought, the talk on divisions and all of the questions, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is what it was about for Paul. He wasn't going to venture into the land of competitive oration. He wasn't going to allow himself to be up there compared to others. He wasn't going to be someone who's going to just do it to dazzle you with words. He wasn't going to entertain you. It wasn't about the pizzazz factor for Paul. It was about the message of the cross. Because when it's about the pizzazz and the entertainment and the oratory genius, it can easily become about a person. I was arguing this week that Paul's arguing for boring preachers across America, right? No, not really. God's word should never be boring. It should never be boring. It's not. But it's also not about a human being. Paul is less about preaching to the eyes in the church and more about making the focus squarely on what it should be, the cross. He'll even say, notice that when, when it's all about individuals and fancy oration and dazzling performances, that the message has the potential, look what it says, has the potential to be emptied of its power. That's a dangerous place to be when it's all about a person or a ministry or this. When it's all about the I, the message of the cross can become diminished and almost overlooked because it's only about what I want. Be careful, church in Corinth. And he would say the same thing to us today. Be careful, church in Kent that it's not about a person, a ministry, a style. It is about Jesus Christ. And so this morning, the question that we all come back to is to ask that question about ourselves. What are we making church about? Where is our true focus? Is it on a person. I mean, in a world of, of pastors and podcasts and teachers and life group leaders and, and ministries, and where is our true allegiance? When our focus is not on the cross, it can be very easily on people who will, let me break this to you, who will disappoint you. People will fail you. Ministries will fail you. Podcasts will fail you. But there is one who will not fail you. His name is Jesus Christ. That is where our focus needs to be. And if you don't know who he is, I would love to spend more time talking to you about Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him. It's the most important thing that we can talk about. After church, I would love to, over in the corner, spend some time if you have a question about that. And for the rest of us, to ask the hard questions about where our true focus is this morning. God's word raises the bar in what it means to be a part of the church. And there's no I in church. But there is a Christ who loves you. Let's pray.
Dear God, we thank you so much for your word that we gather around to study each and every week. It's not about human opinion that we have gathered this morning. It is about your opinion for our lives that we care about. And Lord, forgive us so many times when we make it about me and I and help us to have our focus on you. And thank you for what you do give us. You give us people and you give us ministries and you give us all of these wonderful gifts to teach us. But may they always be pointing us further to the cross. We love you. And uh, our church is in your hands. Our focus is on you. We pray this in your name. Amen.